and uh, welcome to our talk on um, Are Your Secrets Secure in, uh, in OpenStack? So my name is uh, Dave McCowan, and I'm an engineer at uh, Cisco Systems, and I work in our private cloud group, uh, both on security hardening and security features. And I'm a core reviewer for the uh, Barbican project of OpenStack and previously served as PTL. Hi, and uh, my name's Audie Lee. Uh, I work for Red Hat. I am the current PTL of Barbican. Um, and I've been working on the Barbican project for, uh, I think, since Liberty or so. so. And uh, so here's our agenda for the talk. Um, we're going to start off with, uh, with an introduction of how secrets are used in, uh, in OpenStack and why it's important that they're kept secret. So we'll talk about uh, the use cases. And then that'll feed into why you need uh, key management to protect those secrets. And then to answer the question, are my secrets secure, uh, first we'll talk about a, a set of criteria to evaluate how secure uh, secret storage is. And then we'll talk about the different options of both deployment and plugin choices and we'll evaluate each one and then try to figure out how to compare them and help you all make the decisions of um, are my secrets secure enough uh, for my cloud. So to start off with, um, when we talk about secrets, we're really talking about you know, cryptography. Um, so what are the use cases for, uh, for cryptography in OpenStack? Uh, one is to protect uh, storage. So um, you want to encrypt uh, sensitive data to protect it, and we're protecting it both from privacy to make sure that people who are not supposed to have access to that information can access it, but also to make it tamper resistant. Uh, you want those, uh, those records to be um, uh, secure and to somebody can't tamper with that information. Um, another use case for cryptography is authentication, uh, both on the client side or the server side, to, uh, to prove uh, your identity to the other party. This can involve uh, passphrases, on, for example, on the client side, or X509 uh, certificates offered um, on the server side. Um, in addition, you have uh, secure messaging to, to set up uh, some of these secure connections. You could take either a passphrase or a certificate to start off. The, uh, the, the handshake to start uh, secure messaging. And finally, there's a validation uh, use case. And this is to, uh, you want to prove the integrity of the software before you uh, load or run it in your cloud. And this is the, the signed software case. And what all these have in common uh, in implement, from an implementation point of view is they all require uh, some sort of uh, secret to, uh, uh, to achieve their goals. So in the case of uh, protecting storage, you have encryption keys. In the case of authentication, um, you have uh, X509 certificates usually. And then in the case of uh, validation, you have RSA key pairs, so a pri public-private key pair that you can use to sign software to make sure that it's uh, authentic. And so this is where key management comes in, because you have all these different secret types. Um, uh, to meet these use cases, and these, these need to be stored uh, securely. So you have your different types. Um, and it's a good idea to, to centralize key storage in this case. Um, if it's all in one place, you have just one thing to protect. If they're scattered all around your cloud, then you'd have lots of different places to protect it. Um, having them centralized also helps with audit. If you want to need to go back in time and figure out who accessed which secret at which time, um, having it centralized lets you keep a, a concise audit log. Um, in addition to that, with, when you're talking about encryption keys, to have a strong encryption key, you want to have one generated with uh, lots of entropy. Uh, so it will be really hard to guess or predict what those keys are. And then by having a, a centralized uh, key manager where you can generate keys with uh, specialized uh, hardware, you can guarantee that you're generating uh, strong and, and hard to guess um, encryption keys. And that ties in with uh, specialized hardware, which can also be used for um, uh, storing the secrets or encrypting the secrets. And we'll talk about that as we get to the different uh, deployment options. Um, so how this all ties together with, uh, with OpenStack is uh, we have Barbican, which is the secret manager um, for OpenStack. So it's a project about six years old. Um, like most uh, shared services in OpenStack, it provides a RESTful interface to, uh, to access the performance functions. Uh, it uses Keystone for authentication and authorization. Uh, to, to verify users who want to perform um, actions with Barbican. It uses Oslo policy to pr either set up a role-based access control or access control lists. And, um, and it provides uh, a set of different um, um, access points, either through um, the RESTful HTTP interface, through the OpenStack CLI, or through uh, Python uh, libraries. 
And then finally, there's uh, the configurable plug plugins, and uh, that's what we'll talk about uh, for the, the rest of this talk. So uh, to answer the question, are your secrets secure, um, let's talk about what it means for your secrets to be secure. And um, there's five pillars that uh, we want to talk about today. So the first uh, pillar for consideration is security. Uh, you want to make sure that your secure storage is, in fact, secure. And this means uh, both protection for the secrets that you want to secure. Usually, they're secured by encryption. So therefore, you need to have uh, some sort of master key or a key encryption key. So you also want to evaluate how that master key is protected. Um, an important part of security is that you want these keys to be separate from your storage. So if you have your encrypted data and your key and they're stored on the same hard drive, that's pretty dull. That's pretty easy to defeat uh, if, if you're a hacker or a, a, a rogue admin. So you want to have some sort of separation and isolation between your secret storage and your data. Um, your use case may involve uh, different uh, access roles for, for administrators. So by separating your, your key service on one set of servers with one set of admins and your maybe storage admins on a different set of stores, uh, servers, uh, you have some sort of opportunity for, for different roles um, and, and separation of privileges. Um, another important aspect is the integrity of storage, is these keys, in addition to being um, uh, hidden away, you also want to make sure that no one can tamper with those keys. Um, so the integrity of storage is an important consideration. And then finally, uh, depending where you live and what industry you're in, you may have a set of uh, standards that you need to comply with, whether it's FIPS or ANSI or GDPR, et cetera. Um, this will be a, another consideration as you make your, your choice on uh, secret storage. Um, so the second pillar that you may want to consider is the maturity of the solution that you choose. Uh, some of you may choose a tried and true solution. You want to make sure that someone else has tried it and worked out all the kinks. Uh, however, there is a lot of innovations uh, in security and, and new hardware and um, new open source projects um, that maybe you want to take advantage of. So you've got a trade off there of whether you want to have a very secure um, tried and true solution or whether you want to take advantage of, uh, of some new innovations. Um, ease of use, of course, is a consideration, um, but you need to consider day zero as well as day one and, and day one on. Um, so perhaps you want ease of installation. So some of these plugins we'll talk about today are very easy to, to install, one line of config, and, and, and off you go. But then if you think about your ongoing operations, if you ever need to um, rekey your secrets, um, that can be more complicated if, uh, if there's not a good um, um, mechanism in place for, for rekey. And we'll talk about that as we talk about our, the deployment options. And then finally, ease of use. As you may, if you already have an HSM, for example, you may really want to have um, uh, a, a secure storage plugin that's compatible with your existing uh, infrastructure. And that would be easier uh, for you to use, so another consideration. And the final two aspects for consideration as you evaluate your, uh, your secret storage. Uh, one is, you know, we're operating in clouds. We need to run in cloud scale. Um, so your secrets need to be highly available. Um, if, as your cloud is running, if the secrets are not accessible, then your data is not going to be accessible because you won't be able to decrypt that data. So you want to make sure that you um, um, have a highly available um, access. Um, it needs to be durable as well. So you want to make sure that um, you've got syncs back in, sync databases, or, or multiple storage repositories in case you know uh, one or the other crashes. And then performance, of course, uh, is an aspect depending on the number of uh, volumes you have or the number of um, um, instances you have booting, um, you want to make sure that you can handle the load of secret um, access attempts uh, that you expect in your cloud. And then finally, cost. We live in the real world. We need to balance cost. Um, you can get lower costs um, by taking advantage of your existing infrastructure. Um, or is the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the specialized hardware, some of the stuff we talk about, uh, such as HSMs, um, can be very expensive, though the ones that are large and can run at cloud scale. So uh, that'll be a, a factor as well in your decisions. So uh, to highlight, I mentioned uh, compliance. Uh, so um, here's some highlights that you may want to think about as you evaluate security uh, storage solutions. So one is uh, so GDPR. Um, all of these obviously are a lot more complicated, but maybe I wanted to just pull out a couple of uh, key aspects that, that apply to, to these scenarios. So one of the key aspects of GDPR that that's, might be hard to meet in a cloud is the right to be forgotten. So if someone says, please erase all my data, um, that can be tricky to do when you have backups and um, 
in different places. You don't know exactly where the data is in the cloud because everything's virtualized. But if all the data is encrypted and you have the key and you can find the key and delete the key securely, then you've wiped the data and you can prove that it's been wiped. So that can be a real handy feature uh, with key management. So you want to make sure your solution can do a, a, a true delete of a key when you want to do that. Um, ANSI is another um, um, compliance standard uh, in France. Um, one of the keys there is that, that jumps out at me is the separate user roles. Um, they want to make sure that the administrator who's responsible for the secrets uh, cannot have access to the, the, the data. And so you want to make your deployment decisions so maybe that's possible, that whoever can log into the key server cannot log into the data server and, and vice versa. Uh, so there's a consideration. And then uh, common criteria is another uh, popular one that will deal with choices around encryption um, key lengths and um, access to audit logs and, and so forth. And uh, so something else to consider that make sure your, um, your security storage choices uh, match whatever compliance standards that you need to um, uh, comply with. So let's start talking about uh, deployment decisions. Um, there's two uh, types of decisions uh, we'll talk about uh, in the remainder of the talk. One is the architecture choice and the second is the, uh, the plugin choice. So first, uh, the architecture choice. Um, so, so we know we want to use Barbican because that's the secret manager for OpenStack. Uh, we need to figure out where to run it if you have an existing cloud. Um, your typical architecture, you may have controllers where you run the shared services. Um, you'll have specialized servers, separate servers for the compute where you're running the instances. And then you'll have uh, a set of storage servers where, uh, where your volumes and the, and the data is actually stored. And so now we have a choice. I'm going to add Barbican to the mix. Where do I want to run Barbican? Um, uh, a pretty poor choice, of course, would be on the storage servers because, like I said, you want to keep your keys separate from the data. Um, one very reasonable choice, since Barbican's a shared service, uh, that's where shared services usually run on the controllers. So that would be a very reasonable place to put Barbican and run on the controllers where Keystone and Horizon and, and, uh, and Glance uh, usually run. Uh, that would make a lot of sense. Um, unless you really want to make sure you have separation of, uh, of privileges, in which case maybe you want to add a set of uh, key manager servers and run Barbican on its, uh, its own infrastructure. And that would be um, uh, a way to add some additional isolation uh, to privileges. Um, the next decision in deployment, um, so Barbican is really a secret manager as opposed to the secret storage. And what it does is it provides, um, um, like a lot of OpenStack services, provides plugins on the back end and you can decide where you want to store your secrets. Uh, we have two different types of um, secret storage. One are called database adapters, in which case you have uh, one part that does encryption, encrypts the secrets, and then the encrypted secret is then stored in the database. So you have those two parts. Uh, there's a second set of uh, adapters, which are um, uh, KMS adapters, in which case the key is given to that, um, that service such as an HSM, and then the secret is actually stored within the HSM, within the specialized hardware. And uh, we'll get into more details with that as we talk about the different plugins. So the, uh, the first plugin we're going to talk about and then evaluate for how secure is it is uh, Simple Crypto. Um, so as you can guess by the name, uh, the answer to the question, is it secure? The answer is going to be no, but it's still a valid choice. So it's worth uh, understanding and, and having that as a, uh, as a baseline for comparison. So in this case, we start off with the user up on top of the screen, and he sends a post to Barbican and say, here, please store my secret. Um, so Barbican is running, and in this case, there's a key encrypting key, and that is stored in the barbican.cont file. And so you see there's just one key in this scenario. Uh, Barbican will, will take the secret given to it, will take the key from the, from the file, encrypt the secret, and then store the secret uh, in the database. And uh, as you can see, that's very simple, as you can imagine. Uh, to configure it, it's just one line of key, which is that single key. But uh, so let's evaluate, evaluate it against our scorecard in these five pillars. So the first question on security, it's not very secure because um, there's a single global key, and uh, which means for every project, for every tenant, it's still that single key. Um, and there's no storage uh, system separation because the key is right there um, yeah, within the Barbican file and the master key is stored there unencrypted, so it's easy if someone has access to the file system to see that key. So um, uh, security is, is not very good. Probably still better than nothing. Um, in terms of maturity, uh, this is very well tested. This is what we use uh, as we develop. This is what we use uh, running in the, in the gate um, 
in the CI CD for OpenStack. Um, so it's it's been tested, you know, thousands and thousands of times. So uh, uh, at least we know that it's stable and it works well. Um, in terms of ease of use, it's sort of a mixed bag. It's simple to deploy. It runs right there on the same server as Barbican. It's one line of config. You just have to give it a uh, a master key. But if you think uh, long run, if that key is ever compromised and you need to rekey it, um, now you're stuck because you need to replace that master key. Then you need to re um, replace all your secrets, which may then um, in turn require re-encrypting all your data. So uh, not very good just having a single key to encrypt all your secrets directly. But in terms of uh, scale, that's fine. Um, HA is easy because your controllers are already HA. So um, and having simple crypto run part of Barbican, you automatically get the HA. And the cost, of course, is great. It's free because uh, you already have that. So, um, so that's simple crypto. So let's see if we can do better with some other options. And I'll, I'll turn off the audio. Okay. Um, so the next option uh, that is a, little, a lot better than simple crypto uh, is something called a PKCS11 plugin. Um, and the PKCS11 plugin is essentially, it's, it's also um, a database adapter. Um, in the sense that, uh, so you can, right over here, you can imagine that at the top, um, you have the user saying, you know, store my key, store my secret, please. Um, in the back end over here, you have this database plugin that um, goes and gets the keys from a, another device, um, and it talks PKCS11 to that device. Now, depending on the type of device that's back there, you have different options which give you different amounts of security. So um, if you're talking, for example, to an HSM, um, then you're going to get a lot of security there. Um, if you're talking, uh, you could talk to something like a soft HSM. You could talk to a, a, hard, a hardware HSM. Um, you could talk to uh, various other devices, and we'll talk about some of the different possibilities over here. Um, in this particular case, I believe, uh, yeah, we're talking specifically about talking to an HSM. Itself. Um, so in this case, you, you talk to your HSM. There are actually two keys there. One is a master key encryption key. So this is the key that is actually used to. Um, uh, 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 there's a couple of different layers here. So um, first of all, um, when a project first goes and talks to Barbican, um, there is a project key encryption key, a project encryption key that is generated within Barbican um, and that is encrypted by the key encryption key and that is stored in the database. Okay. And then subsequently, whenever a secret is stored within Barbican, um, what we do is we retrieve that key encryption key from the database, bring it back into the key store, uh, into, into the HSM, um, and then unencrypt it, um, and then encrypt the secret with that particular key. So as a result, then you have a separation because you have separation between different projects because different projects are, are encrypted by different project key encryption key. Uh, but at the same time, all of those are encrypted by uh, the master key encryption key, which is stored in the HSM. Um, in addition, to provide more um, sort of authentication for the encryption, each of the key project key encryption keys are actually signed, and an HMAC is generated with this HMAC key that's here inside the database, inside the database, inside the the HSM. So you have two keys here. Again, because it's a database adapter, the the keys, uh, the secrets, and the project key encryption keys are stored in the database, um, but you're talking PKCS11 to a key store like an HSM. So let's evaluate what that looks like. Well, your security is great uh, because you do have hardware separation. You, an HSM is a, um, a device that is designed, uh, you know, it's specifically engineered to be tamper-proof and uh, provide good security, to provide uh, good entropy and so on and so forth. The idea is that once your key's in the HSM, it doesn't come out. Um, and uh, so therefore, you have hardware protection of keys. You have separation of, that, of those keys because those keys are in a completely separate device. Um, typically, the HSMs all have various certifications. So you're going to get your common criteria, your ANSI, your FIPS. Uh, you have to be careful there because, for example, ANSI only accepts certain types of HSMs. Uh, and not others, and, and, and so on. So, But all of the HSMs generally have some sort of secur uh, security certification, um, and so you would need to pick the one or the ones that you have that would match the certifications that you would need. Um, and then finally, because of the, the HMAC, you have authenticated encryption that takes place. So great security. Um, the maturity, um, it is, uh, uh, again, 
uh, very, a lot of people are using it, and I've met a lot of people here that, that are using HSMs that are there. Um, but right now, uh, there is no upstream testing uh, within the, um, with the HSM. Now that will, uh, so that's unfortunate because may, basically because the gate doesn't have an HSM that's available for to it. Um, we don't have HSMs that we can use every time we, we produce a patch um, and have a testing there. That may change in future. Uh, but we do have downstream testing, of course. So uh, I have to know for OSP, for example, that I have been working specifically with certain HSMs and testing them and confirming them and making sure that, that all of this works. Um, and then, in fact, uh, there are some HSM vendors themselves um, who are talking to us and, and trying to get our test suites within their, within their test suites uh, to ensure that whenever they produce a new version of the HSM, it doesn't break while again, for instance. Um, so maturity is sort of a mixed bag, but in general, it's pretty good. Um, ease of use, it's relatively complicated to deploy. Um, the, you know, you have an extra device, uh, which, you know, you also need to have a redundancy of uh, as well, and you need to set things up. HSMs are not necessarily the simplest things to set up. Um, for example, um, you know, uh, for a Talus HSM, for, um, in order for you, to, for your client to register to be a, a client of that, it actually has to be registered by a separate admin server first, um, and then you have to do the registration as well. So it's a relatively complicated process um, to set, set things up. However, um, beyond that, um, operations like rekeying and so on are very possible. Um, in particular, um, you can rekey the, the, the master the master key encryption key, uh, in which case the only thing you would need to do is to re-encrypt all of the project key encryption keys, because those are the ones that are, that are encrypted there. Um, uh, you can do the same thing for the HMAC, and then that, all that means you would need to do is recalculate the HMACs and so on. So in general, rekeying is very possible, and it's, a, it's an easy thing to do, and, then, and we do have some utilities within, HS, within Barbican that allows you to do that. Um, failover, uh, scaling, of course, HSMs, uh, you, you have your, your standard failover mechanisms for Barbican, putting it you know, behind HE proxy, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then, of course, the HSMs themselves have their mechanisms for ensuring that um, you have failover between HSMs. Again, difficult, uh, tricky to set up, but, um, but possible and available. Uh, big downfall of here is, is this is a great security solution but it, it's expensive. Um, and depending on, you, you gotta remember, of course, that all of your encryption operations are taking place in the HSM because the master key encryption key is inside the HSM. Um, so even when you're decrypting a secret, you're going in there, you're getting the project key encryption key, you're getting a handle to that key, and, that, and as a result of taking that handle, you're then decrypting and doing all your decryptions inside the HSM. So you need something that's fairly uh, performant, and depending on your performance operations, that could be something that's quite expensive. Um, so this is, you know, one option, but it's, it, it could be expensive. Um, SGX, so um, SGX is very interesting. Um, there is a bunch, uh, a bunch of folks in, at uh, Intel that have developed a plugin using the SGX technology. Um, and the S SGX technology is essentially a technology that Intel has created uh, to create an enclave of encrypted memory um, inside, um, inside an Intel machine. Um, and so this encrypted memory um, has various keys. It's, there's a seal key that is used there to encrypt all of the data that's inside there. Um, and it's essentially sort of like a, like a poor man's HSM in some ways. Um, uh, but, but essentially you have this this memory that is encrypted, uh, you can't get to it, you can't, um, um, can't get anything out of it out of, without the, seal, the sealing key, so there's a lot of things there. Uh, not only that, but there's the capability of doing things like attestation, for instance, and making sure that uh, the proper server is going, talking to the proper clients and so on and so forth. Um, and they wrote a, um, uh, a bunch of code um, and a plugin specifically using the SGX um, where, they, where, where, they, where they work with these operations. So, great idea, Fant good security. Um, they say that you get essentially the same type of security as you would with an HSM. Uh, you do have hardware protection in your keys because essentially this is something that uh, where the keys and the, and the entropy and so on are guaranteed by the Intel hardware. Um, you've got good protection of your database entries because the, their plugin actually did a validation in an HMAC on, on the database entries that are there as well too. 
all the authentication uh, is using um, GCM mode encryption, so there's authenticated authorization and encryption there. Um, and you have the possibility of doing attestation. Um, the downside is um, that all this wonderful code doing it out there, um, and it's up in a, in a GitHub somewhere, uh, but it hasn't been pushed up into Bobbik and upstream, uh, which means that it's, unless people are using it, it's, it essentially becomes a bit rotted necessarily. Even, if, even the changes that they suggested for Bobbik and haven't been pushed upstream yet. Um, if there's anyone that's truly, really interested in, in SGX, encourage you to, to go through it and, and, and take advantage of that code, but at this point, um, no one has taken, taken it in and taken you know, ownership of it. Um, and so the maturity it's, is, you know, it, the, the results that they got were, were great. Um, they have a great paper um, which you know, details all of those results and good performance and so on, but we're not quite sure. That was uh, a year ago. We're not quite sure uh, what the status is now. Um, so that's the disadvantage over there. Um, hopefully that will change in future um, and someone will take that up. Um, Rekeying, um, it's relatively complicated to deploy, um, but uh, as things would be, but uh, the rekeying is very possible. Um, there is, they do talk about failover and HA and so on in different ways of talking, of having two different Intel devices and two different enclaves talking to each other um, and having the keys uh, you, know, you have to replicate the keys between enclaves, and there are ways of getting of being able to do that. Performance, uh, they report to be very, very good. Um, it is Intel hardware, um, and it's not clear what the costs and so on are there, but it's certainly not as much as an HSM would be. So, uh, this one is a relatively new one. Uh, this is using the same PKCS 11 plugin that we talked about before, but talking to a device. Um, by, uh, that has been generated by a company called Fortanix. Um, and I know of at least uh, one set of folks that I met here that is actually using this in production. Um, uh, the idea here is that you store the same uh, uh, master keks and the same HMAC keys inside the Fortanix key store, but the Fortanix key store is essentially a, um, an HSM-like device um, that um, is created on top of an SGX enclave. Um, so they've taken what the SGX technology that uh, Intel had provided. Uh, they provided a PKCS11 plug uh, and a KMUP interface into that device. Um, and so you essentially use that enclave like you would um, an, H, uh, an HSM. So it's like an HSM kind of device that has been created using an SGX enclave. Kind of cool. Um, and um, but basically, you're doing the same thing as the PKS11 plugin, same kind of uh, different key uh, manipulations and so on and so forth, um, storing everything inside the database. So, uh, same uh, as with the PKCS11 plugin, as well as with the HSM, you're getting the same sort of security guarantees, hardware separation, you know, you've got the hardware protection of the SGX. There is a possible attest, uh, one of the interesting things that Fortanix has actually done um, is taken the entire Barbican um, uh, process and put it into the enclave itself. Um, and so this allows the entire Barbican process to run within um, this encrypted memory, this secure memory. Um, and at the same time, it allows you then to do attestation between enclaves. So you can do an attestation between a client and, and, uh, and a server uh, to ensure that the clients that, that you want to connect are the ones you want to connect and the servers you want to connect and the servers connect. Um, maturity um, right now, it is, uh, there's no upstream gate at this point, um, but they're, they're, they've been talking to us and um, they plan for Stein uh, to add an upstream gate. Um, they have a, a, um, a hosted uh, SGX enclave that they can use for us to point to, um, to be able to do the, an upstream gate to ensure that we don't break anything uh, in future. So that uh, could be really good in that case. So, Maturity could be good. Um, it's relatively complicated to deploy, but again, you know, it's 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 a good solution. Uh, Rekeying is definitely possible. Same sort of mechanisms as with for the PKCS11. Uh, performance has been reported to be good, um, and um, I don't really know what the cost is, but um, uh, that's something you'd have to check with Fortanix. So, um, came a plugin. So now we've gone from uh, 
the previous plugins that were there were all database adapters. That is, the, the, the secrets were stored within the Barbican database, but the, with the keys being encrypted inside the, um, uh, and, and provided from a key store. Uh, now we're going to uh, ones that are secret store adapters. Uh, so in this particular case, what happens is that the secrets themselves and everything are stored in a completely different device. Um, so we have something that's a KMIP plugin, which is something that talks KMIP to a key store somewhere else out there. Okay, and you can have an HSM that talks uh, KMIP, you can have some other KMIP device, uh, you could even have, uh, for example, the, the one I just talked about, uh, the Voltanix device that can also take talk KMIP. And so you can talk KMIP specifically to this thing, and instead of just encrypting the data um, and so on, what you're doing is you're saying, take the, take the secret, store it there, and then when you want to, bring it back out, right? Um, so those, so the secret there is stored inside the secret store itself, and we have a KMIP plugin that does that. The only thing that gets stored there is the metadata, and the metadata basically says, well, when I want to go get my secret, where do I need to go? What secret do I need to get, you know, uh, to get it from the secret store? So, KMIP plugin that we have, great separation, right, separation of key store uh, versus Barbican. Uh, access is controlled by however you, uh, you have access policies to your HSM. Um, maturity um, is the only thing that, in this particular case, is kind of tough. Um, uh, the KMIP plugin that was written uh, was uh, implemented using PyKMIP, um, and this was written by a bunch of Johns Hopkins guys, um, and we're not quite sure uh, whether it's going to be continue to be maintained. So. Um, in fact, as it turns out, the, the upstream gate has been broken for um, several weeks now, um, and we don't quite know how to fix it. So uh, we could probably fix it, and, uh, but then the question is, from a long-term perspective, uh, how, you know, how long that's going to that's be doable like that. So that's the main, the main disadvantage of that one. Uh, and of course, you need a KMIP device, which you know, could, depending on cost and scale and so on, depends on the device that you're talking to. Dog tag. Um, so this is actually a project that I worked uh, that I worked on. Uh, Dog tag um, is a component of something called the Red Hat certificate system, um, and it was a component that was used to store keys. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, you could store the keys using encryption keys that are either stored in an HSM uh, or in an NSS database. Um, and uh, again, it's the same sort of same sort of thing. It's a secret store plugin. So what that means is you're actually just storing the secrets and storing a reference to the data um, inside the Bobbit database. So completely separated. Um, the nice thing about the uh, so let's see what that looks like. So again, great security, uh, hardware separation. Uh, you can store it either in an HSM or you have software. So uh, you've got sort of a. a um, higher cost and a lower cost solution as well too. Uh, dog tag itself, when you use it with an HSM, um, has various, you know, the FIPS and common criteria and various uh, types of, of certifications. Um, it is tested with the upstream gate. Uh, it's been around for a while now, um, and it's, it's tested every time you have a patch there. Um, it's relatively easy to install and configure. Rekeying, of course, is very possible. Uh, the disadvantage and the main, the main reason that a lot of people haven't used it is that it's another system and it's a relatively complicated system. Um, and so it's another system that you have to add um, and, and to manage and there's redundancy potentially there. Uh, and, and of course you need to have redundancy so you have to have another system there. Um, it may be a perfectly reasonable thing if you, for example, you have uh, uh, an IDM system uh, which is a uh, Red Hat identity manager type system if you have one already there that already has this particular system in there, um, and so you could end up reusing that system that you, you currently already have. Um, so that might be a, a viable option there, that way you don't actually need another system to manage. Um, failover, of course, is possible in different ways. Uh, and the only concern that we have over there is, um, you know, there could be a concern about performance depending on how much performance you actually need, because here you have multiple hops, right, so you're not talking uh, you're going from Barbican, Barbican to, to dog tag, dog tag to your HSM, getting your secrets, bringing it back. They may be, it may be less performant to say going through the PKCS11 plugin and going directly to your HSM. And yeah, it depends on your performance. Uh, but that would be true for every secret management system that was outside and, and extracted away from Barbican. Um, and of course it's free because it's part of CentOS and part of RHEL. So 
water or algal secretion. So, vaults. Um, so this is a relatively new plugin over here. Again, it's a, a secret store plugin that is separated away from from uh, from Barbican. Um, you store the secrets directly there, and this is basically you pass the secret in, and it's stored within Vault. Uh, Vault itself can, of course, uh, contain a secret that it has. Uh, you store the sort of uh, Shamir secret share, share kind of thing. So it has its own encryption keys there, as well as, uh, or you could store them with an HSM. You store within an HSM, um, you know, that, that costs that cost money. Um, so, uh, security there of the vaults, uh, you've got your process and your physical separation. Again, it's a separate key store um, that is there and you can put it on a separate machine or something like that. Uh, right now, the vault plugin that is available um, is not quite ready for prime time um, in the sense that the authorization model uh, that is used there is actually very simple right now. Um, it uses like a root token or something like that, which is something that vault says don't do, don't do that, do something more secure. During the uh, Stein cycle, uh, we're, we're adding things to the Vault plugin to make sure that it's, it's the security model is more robust uh, and that we're doing some of the right things there. Um, so that's, it's something that's definitely fixable and it should be fixed hopefully in the Stein cycle. Uh, it is integration, it's possible to integrate with an HSM, but you, you have to pay money then. And that's, that's there, that there. Um, there is a test for this in the upstream gates right now. A Vault itself is, you know, has come up and is being deployed in a number of different places, so it's probably relatively mature um, at this point. Um, and, and again, just the plugin itself specifically, as I mentioned, is fairly new and still being improved in Stein. Um, Vault, one of the key things about Vault is that they make it really easy to deploy um, and make it very easy to do things like rekeying and so on and so forth. Uh, they do have a, a chain failover, but I believe that also costs money p potentially. Um, and again, performance, we don't really know yet because it's still new. Um, so, but uh, I believe, I've heard of people that are, that are using and trying and testing it out and we'll see. Um, basic mode is free, uh, money for HSMs and probably the HA, so. Okay. So, in conclusion, um, you know, kind of question of what plugins do I use? Um, uh, simple crypto is better than nothing. Um, it, it's, uh, um, you know, nothing basically means that all of your secrets are, are stored inside your, 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 your config files all over your OpenStack deployment. Um, and so you have multiple files uh, that have the same level of encryption, but that are, that are basically in the open, in the, in the clear, and you have, to, um, you, you have to secure all of those files. Um, if, you might, if you're going to do that, you might as well secure all of the files in, in one place um, and, in, in Barbican and have a single place where, where things are stored. Um, do you have a, um, a regulatory requirement or a security requirement for an HSM? You know, that is a key thing. Um, if you have a regulatory requirement, uh, then, then you're going to need to use dog tag, you need to use KMIP, you need to use PKCS11, uh, potentially you can use one of the SGX uh, or, or Fortanix. Um, if you don't have that requirement, simple crypto, uh, dog tag again, uh, vault, SGX, um, those are all possible, possible options as well there. Uh, can I use HSMX? That depends, right? Uh, so P PKCS, uh, if typically what I would tell people in terms of can I use HSMX is I would say you got to try out the, uh, um, uh, the PKCS 11 plugin um, and see if you can get it to work. Um, what, one of the things that we've done recently is we've parameterized a lot of the things inside the PKCS11 plugin because PKCS11 is sort of a, a loose API in some ways. It's unclear in some cases, and where it is unclear, the vendors have sort of filled it, filled it in with their own vendor-defined uh, things into, in, in there. Um, and so as long as you have the right parameters and so on and, and the things in there and you have the, 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 the vendor's actual HSM, um, a PKCS11 library, uh, you should be able to make it work. And if you can't make it work, uh, talk to us and we can try and figure out how to make it work. Um, and uh, how do you scale? Uh, well, that's, you know, you need to set up multiple instances of, of Barbican, of course, and that's true. Um, and then, you know, of course, you're going to have to figure out how to make sure that those keys are 
uh, are available to each of those instances. Um, and then finally, performance. Um, depending on your performance things, uh, you, you, you will get better performance. Obviously, if you have something that's a database adapter, there's less hops over there, you can get better performance that way. Best performance you're gonna get is from a simple crypto, because you're basically doing one operation for an encrypt or a decrypt, and it's right there in the keys in memory. Um, uh, but you've got the worst security guarantees there. Um, worst performance uh, might be going to a completely separate system that is, you know, has network latency and a bunch of different things as well, too. Uh, you have to see what kind of performance you, you need to get. Um, but we do need help from HSM vendors. Uh, you know, if, if there's anyone that would love to um, test their stuff with us, we'd love to, love to get to talk to them. Um, I do know that right now I'm, for example, I'm, I'm working with uh, a couple of HSMs and doing performance tests on them and, and seeing how well they do compared to, compared to each other's. So, um, so uh, I think at this point we're at an end. Um, uh, I hope this was informative, but um, if there are any questions, um, it takes, it takes them right now. Hi, you Hi. mentioned that there is SGX plugin for Intel hardware. Uh, there is also, a, like, uh, given the rates of ARM architecture in uh, open infrastructure, do you think it would be make, make sense to create a uh, plugin for using the trusted execution environment uh, in ARM architecture? Like, I, I think it would be even uh, more widely used since it would be uh, it wouldn't be probably specific to one single ARM vendor. Yes, I, I agree. I think there. It, that would be a fantastic idea. Um, yeah. It just hasn't hasn't been done yet. So, but yes, I think that would be great. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I mean, the the SGX one was written by the Intel guys. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other? Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you.